Tell us what I want to share sound and all right. Can you guys see the pause video right now? Yes. <laughs> yes, I can. Now you can. Um, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and get us rolling then. Let me know when you guys can hear it. Yes, can hear it. Hi friends, welcome back to our study of 1 Peter. In this session, we're gonna be in 1 Peter chapter three, verses eight through 22. And just by way of review, we're gonna do this each time, and I know that you're getting, uh, hopefully getting these in your head. It's a framework for understanding uh, this letter. Uh, we wanna maintain our identity in this particular, this particular section, but in order to maintain your identity, you need to know your identity. So we need to remember who he is. We need to have our identity established in him, this orienting truth. We need to have it established in history. We need to have it established in the hope that we have. And we need to remember that this brings us to be a holy people. This causes us to be a holy people. As we live this identity out, we live this identity out in three key relationships. Last time in our last session, we mentioned that these th three key relationships were as we go back as citizens in the world, as we go back as servants, into, and we said maybe our modern day context of workplace would be applicable. Um, and that number three, as we go back into our family, uh, specifically into our relationship with our husband and wife, but that trickles down. This identity that we have needs to be maintained in these three key circles of relationship. In order to maintain that, we have three principles. So I don't wanna be overly confusing, but we're just putting all of these pieces together. And so when we go back, we do three things, we trust, going back to our identity, him, and we trust in that he is faithful in history. We trust that he will be faithful in our hope. And, and so we, we have this reflection of holiness that plays out. We reflect and we witness. My hope is, is that because we've written these on the board several times now, that they will go down deep inside of you, but also build a framework that you can hang these passages on and go, oh, I see how that passage is playing a role in this letter. It's, it's reminding us to trust. It's reminding us to reflect Jesus. It's reminding us that this leads to, and kind of it comes out of, same way that holiness comes out of these three, uh, witness comes out of doing these first two. In our passage today, we, we see a, a switch of theme, although it comes out of, it comes out of these three circles. Um, out of these three circles, we see a change of theme where Peter's gonna say, so sometimes as you go back as sojourners and exiles, this is going to lead to suffering. There's going to be conflict here. There's going to be difficulty. And, and really, suffering becomes the, the theme that plays out from chapter 3, verse 8, as Peter says, finally, all of you. And this finally theme seems to play out all the way from chapter 3, verse 8, all the way through the end of the letter in chapter 5. Suffering, again and again, is going to be something that we need to trust God in, reflect Jesus in, and to be a witness in. So we're, we wanna put these back on the board so that we can reflect on them as we dive into our text today. So Peter says, verse chapter three, verse eight. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Now, this merely just says, <laughs> be like Jesus. So do this as you live in these relationships and as you go back as exiles. Live like Jesus, unity, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart and a humble mind. We're going to need these as we go back. Because verse 9 says, Do not repay evil for evil, or bad for bad, or insult for insult. The, the ESV says reviling for reviling. We use the word insult more readily in our context. So when you go back into these circles, you go back into the world that does not know your identity, does not know Jesus, rejects it, perhaps, and they revile you, they insult you, or they treat you poorly. You don't repay them. Now, how is this possible for us not to repay those who treat us this way? Well, it's because of the fact that we reflect Jesus. Now, Peter had just quoted from the suffering servant text, Isaiah 53. When he was reviled, he remained silent. On the contrary, 
Here's the contrast of our identity, of how we're called to live. Peter says, you as God's people, you bless. Notice the contrast, insult versus blessing. We are a people who blesses others in these relationships that we have. So we go back into our relationship as citizens. Think about, think about the context of Christianity right now on social media. We speak blessing, that this is a gift, a good, a speaking a good rather than speaking a bad. We go back into our workplaces. Think about your workplace context, some of the toxic workplaces we live in. And as God's people, we speak blessing. We speak good rather than speaking bad. In our families, we speak good rather than speaking bad. This is how Jesus taught us to live. Jesus taught us to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us, to turn the other cheek, to walk two miles. Jesus taught us to speak this blessing. So Peter breaks out and he quotes from the Psalm. It's Psalm chapter 34. And it's the same Psalm, by the way, in chapter two, verse three, he says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Because we have tasted that the Lord is good, it shapes how we speak about other people. So now he quotes again from it in chapter three, verse 10. Whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue. You see the theme of speaking? Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are always on the righteous and the ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So even in the quoting of this Psalm, we hear that we're called to reflect Jesus. We're, we're called to be like him as we seek peace and speak a blessing. That we're called to trust God, that he sees us and he knows. So for the, at risk of like writing too many things on the board, let me, let me give you four reminders that Peter has in the midst of this suffering that we have. So we're called to live with these three principles, but let me give you four reminders. I know it's quite a bit, but here's reminder number one. God hears us. Number two, God sees us. Now, these two are connected. But when we're suffering, the context is suffering. When we're suffering, God hears us. God sees us. Here's number three. God will bless us. And number four, God will use us. So these, three, these four things are important to keep in mind in the context of suffering for our passage today. So we're again, we're building the framework of how this letter functions together. And he says, hey, you have this identity. You're going back into these relationships. And in these relationships, you're going to experience some rejection. You're going to experience some injustice. You're going to experience some conflict, some suffering. And when you suffer, you trust in Jesus. You, re you reflect Jesus. You are a witness to Jesus. And you remember, see how these fit together? You remember that he hears you. He sees you. He will bless you. And he will use you. So let's see how these play out. Verse 13. So there is, excuse me, verse 13. Now, well, who is there to harm you if you are zealous to do good? Now, they might go, well, there's a lot of people actually who might harm us. But it's kind of the ultimate harm that Peter is talking about. Like when it comes to this trust, like what can they really do to you? You have eternal life. You have an inheritance that can never spoil or fade. It can never be taken from you. Okay, so what can they really do to me? They can speak insult, but that's going to result in my blessing. They can take my life, but that's going to result in my, life, my eternal life. That's what Peter's getting at here. Verse 14, even if, love that phrase, even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. So God hears us. He said already, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. He, he's, his ears are open to our prayers. He hears us. He sees us. He will bless us. Even if you're insulted, it will result in blessing. And even if, you are suffering. God can even use that suffering. It's as if Peter remembers the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gave, where Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteous sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you, they insult you, they persecute you, and they say all kinds of evil against you because of my sake, because you take this identity and you're living it out in these, war, the, these relationships. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven, and so Peter says here, have no fear of them. We are already called in chapter 2, verse 17, to fear God. We don't need to fear them because we trust him. Have no fear of this suffering and the suffering that comes out of this relationship because ultimately we can trust in God. Over the past few months, one of my favorite passages has been Psalm 27. Now, let me read to you from Psalm 27 about this big view we need of God, to, to, to fear God, to trust in him. 
The psalm says, the Lord is the light of my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, when my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an entire army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war rise against me. I will be confident. And then later on it says, wait for the Lord. Sometimes we're required to wait. Be strong. Let your tar- heart take courage. Wait on the Lord. So we can, we can trust that he hears us, that he sees us, that he will bless us. And in verse 15, we start to see that he will use us. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared, always be ready to be used, even in the midst of suffering. Always be prepared to make a defense. This word is the word up to make an apology or to be a witness. That's this concept. Always be prepared to give a reason. The, the word there could be the logic, the, the reason for the hope that is in you. So notice how this this one verse pulls together together several of these key themes. Always be prepared to give a witness, to give an apology, to, to, to give a reason for the hope that you have. Always be ready in the midst of difficulty for God to be ready to use you. And sometimes it is in the midst of suffering that we have our greatest platform for proclaiming the gospel. Let me say that again. Sometimes suffering is our greatest platform to proclaim the gospel. Why is that? because it's in suffering that we reflect this hope and it's in suffering that we look like Jesus. So when we do this, when we give a reason for our hope, the reason, what is the reason for our hope? It is the resurrection of Jesus. It is the historical resurrection that even when all seemed dark, God had the power to bring Jesus back from the dead and he will do the same in our dark moment as well. We reflect Jesus in our suffering when we hope in the midst of suffering and we tell people the reason for that hope. And that reason is, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And we live between the time of his resurrection and the time when he will be revealed again and we will be resurrected with him. So when we give this answer, when we give this defense, this apology, this witness as to the hope that is in us, we do it with gentleness and respect. In other words, we honor. Remember Peter said, honor everyone, honor the emperor. We do it with gentleness and respect. Now in our debate culture, at times as believers, this is a helpful reminder to us, that we do this recognizing the value in others, that they are created in God's image as well. So we go back and we want to witness to them. We want to bring them to a place of understanding the reason for our hope, but we do it with an attitude of humility, treating them with gentleness and respect. We do this with a good conscience. We do this with pure motivation so that even though we're slandered, those who revile us, those who do this, they might be put to shame. Peter says it's better for you to suffer to good to do good than by suffering to do evil. This is God's will. This is trusting in him. Verse 18, for Christ also Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Notice what he's saying. Jesus in history, he suffered on behalf of those who were unrighteous. And there's a purpose, so that he might bring us to God. Sometimes in your own suffering You need to remember that he hears us, he sees us, he he blesses us, but he will use us. And he can use the suffering of the righteous for the unrighteous to bring them to God. Now, Jesus was put to death in the flesh, Peter says, but he was made alive in the spirit. And that's our story. What can they do to us? Ultimately, we will be made alive. We will be brought to life with Jesus and we will, Peter says, be blessed. Next, in the next few verses, verses 19 through 22, Peter uses kind of an odd illustration. Uh, He uses an illustration from Noah. And again, notice that over and over again, whether that's uh, in the passage regarding uh, wives and husbands, he refers to Abraham and his wife. Um, Here we have a story of Noah, and and he kind of takes this story and says, you're kind of like living in the days of Noah. What is he doing? He's heightening the circumstances. Well, what's true for the days of Noah? It was a dark time. It was a time when the majority of people in the relationships of of Noah and his family had rejected what God had said. And yet Noah is called to live out his faith. He's called to live out his identity. He's called to trust and he's called to to obey. And so for Peter, he picks up on this this theme of this story of Noah and he says, this is kind of like your story. Now he does it in an odd way. He talks about the resurrection of Jesus. and, And this is a difficult passage. It's one of the most difficult in the New Testament. 
He says, Jesus was made alive in the spirit and he went and he proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. And God was patient with them. And he was patient with them while the ark was being prepared in which a few people, that is Noah's family, eight persons were brought safely through the water. Now there's some, some difficulty here. Where, where did Jesus go and, and who are these spirits and, and when did this happen? I think verse 22 clarifies, but I encourage you for the sake of our study together, uh, this may be a good opportunity for you to, to grab a commentary if this intrigues you. I think verse 22, however, clarifies it, and it really does become kind of the, the common view in most commentaries, at least modern commentaries. Uh, this view is this, that Jesus in his resurrection, resurrected after his death, proclaimed this heralding is a pro proclamation of victory and that these spirits who are imprisoned, prison never used of uh, Hades or of hell, these spirits are those spirits who have been in rebellion. And verse 22 clarifies that they, in this sense, are subjected to Jesus. So the, the proclamation there is that Jesus has won the day. But sometimes the debate of this causes us to miss the point of this. And so I wanna bring us back to the point. If you wanna get into the debate, I encourage you to do so. What is the point of the story? This was a time of darkness where people rejected God. And few people experienced suffering, but they were ultimately saved and used through this season of suffering. Peter says, this is your story. Now, later on, he's gonna say, no, you live in a time of darkness, chapter four, verse three. He says, the time has passed that suffices to do what other Gentiles do. They live with sensuality and passions and drunkenness and orgies and drinking parties and lawless idolatry. They're, they're surprised when you don't join them, Peter says, in this flood, notice the word there, this flood of debauchery. We're gonna deal with that passage later, but Peter says, no, no, you're, as you go back, you're living like you're living in the days of Noah, but God's faithful. And like in the days of Noah, you will be saved. In fact, you have been saved. Peter says, baptism is like this water that Noah was saved through. Baptism, he says, corresponds to this, and it now saves you. It's not the, not the water, it's not the removal of dirt from the body, but it's this pledge to your identity. It's this pledge of trust to who God is. It's this pledge and appeal to God saying, I need you to save me. I need to get on the boat. So Peter says, this is a pledge. It's an appeal to God for a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus. What's the reason for our hope? The resurrection of Jesus. Verse 22, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with all the angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. So there is nothing that is not under Jesus's control. Even when we suffer, we recognize who he is, that he is still in control. He hears us, he sees us, he blesses us, and he will use us. And so Peter wraps all of this up and brings it back to the core of our identity marker where we identified ourselves with Jesus and says, remember at your baptism, you made a public declaration of your identity with Jesus. Romans 6 says we are united with Jesus uh, like this in his death and in his resurrection at baptism. Baptism admits that we need rescue and we can't do this on our own. It's this identifying moment where we are buried with Jesus and we are resurrected with him. It's this physical picture of our proclamation of what we preach and what we teach and what we believe. We die to ourself and our selfishness and our flesh and our sin, and we're resurrected to walk a new life like Jesus. It's an act, it's, it's not an action that we do to earn anything, but it's this passive moment of participation and submissive. It says, I can't do this on my own. I need the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I need the church. And so it's this powerful confession of faith. And Peter says, this, this story of Noah corresponds to this. And you're living in this kind of a situation where you are called to go out and you are called to be used by God and to proclaim his truth. It reminds me of what Peter said in the book of Acts. It's the beginning of his story as he makes this proclamation, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and for your children and all those who are far off, all those whom the Lord will call to himself. And then Peter says to them, save yourself from this crooked generation. We're living, Peter would say, in unprecedented times. For this audience, he talks about the days of Noah. He talks about it being the last times. And, and he would say the same thing is true for us. We live in an inaugurated moment where God is calling his people to come out of darkness and into his wonderful light. But he's also reminding us that as we go into this world as exiles, we're gonna need to be reminded that he still hears us. He still sees us. That no, matter, no matter what happens to us, he will bless us and that he wants to use us. So let's trust him 
Let's reflect Jesus and let's be a witness to the world. Any initial thoughts out of that? So, um, we're always supposed to be kind, and uh, if we go through a period of suffering, that that could be used for the good for us and for others because he is always with us and sees us. I think that's an excellent point. Diana. And it's also counterintuitive, right? Um, yes. I mean, it suffering for us, but um, if we have faith in God, he's, he's with us and there's going to be a positive outcome. Is that, am I um, understanding that correctly? If we have faith in him and that all things happen for a reason and um, when we have faith in him, um, it's sort of like I always think about a, a dark cloud has a silver lining. Mm -hmm. And so even though you're going through tough times, um, it'll be um, God is there and you have faith in him. And, and so um, there will be a, a bright time because he could be using you as the witness. Yeah, I, th I think that's, especially that last thing you said there, Diana, I think is very important in the sense of, that even in the outline that I've got here on the screen now, it doesn't say that God will remove the suffering necessary. It says that he necessarily, it says that he will bless us. Right. And so what we might be called to do is to reflect Christ while we suffer to those who don't know Christ. Okay. Where they, where they, where they ask the question of how are you able to endure this? And or what, what do you think? what what is this happen or or why is this happening to you or you know and I, I guess one of the things is well if you trust in God you have faith in God why would he let you go through something like this right and and I just reply to them that he he knows what's best he knows uh what's in the future and this is um just a um a time that's passing and better things will be in the future uh -huh. i know you guys just got back in when do we lose you guys there in the in the room right when diane started talking i think Right. Okay, so now, so now she has to repeat everything word for word. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just to sum it up, without jumping from tree to tree, like I have a habit of, I'm trying to get, you know, more to the point instead of, you know, writing a book about it. <laughs> um, I, uh, I guess what I had uh, meant to say is uh, when you go through suffering, you have faith in God and you know he sees the future and know what's ahead and and you have faith that it's all going to work out um and and using that as a a 
a witness to other people. But then, you know, I was just saying at the very end how some people will say, well, if, if you're a Christian, why would God do this to you or make you uh, suffer? Or why are you suffering when um, you believe in God and he shouldn't let you suffer? And I was thinking what I usually say is that I know I'm in his hands and I have faith in him and he knows what's in store for me. And if, when I go through this, you know, things will turn out okay or even better than I would have ever thought that they could have. Yeah. I, I, was, I was really just thinking and I was, you know, so I'm gonna pose this question out there. Give me one major persona from scripture that everything was always hunky dory for. Can you guys think of anybody? That somebody was, you know, great without having any uh, stress or problems in their life. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I did. I was, I was, I was really trying hard to find one. Again, I don't like to use the word character, but one, you know, one Bible person that we have from Scripture that, you know, oh, you go, you know, everything was just always good for them. And I couldn't immediately call to mind any. Mm -hmm. Am I missing somebody? I don't think so. <laughs> and in fact, the typical there is for most Bible personas, it's exactly the opposite, right? Yeah. It, it's not that there's just, you know, and you know, there's the ups and the downs and all that, but but generally it, you know, it tends to be more about the ways that they suffer or endure hardship or whatever is there. And, you know, to Diana's point is that, and this is the point, you know, this is from his outline, if you can see it there on the screen, since God will bless us when we suffer, his outline point here is not that God will always remove suffering. Right. Um, that we will suffer, but that he's going to bless us. And, and, and the next thing is he will use us when we suffer. Yeah, which, which, you know, I would much prefer that he, uh, I'd much prefer to be used without the suffering, please. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. But I, I don't think, I think that, you know, all of us, you know, who are, uh, especially Christians, um, when we suffer, that's um, Sometimes uh, people that maybe are not Christians have a difficult understanding because if we, uh, if Christians are, are suffering, then why would God make you suffer? But suffering's where we grow. Exactly. Yeah. And so... If you never, I mean, the way I see it, if you don't ever suffer, you don't ever really get a deeper understanding of who God is and what he does. Right. I agree. And also, um, even, you know, when you're wanting something to happen and it's just not happening in your time. And he, I feel like he's teaching you patience that we have to rely on him have faith in him and sometimes you know it's longer for us to think that we should have to wait for something but you know I feel like in the outcome it's better than we would have had if we would have been impatient and done it ourselves I guess I'm not sure if I'm making that very clear I think you're. I think you're being clear, the Diana. And to to Donna's point, um, you know, we recognize this in almost everything. You know, whether you're if it's you know exercise or working out, like the the thing that strengthens muscle is resistance. If there's if there's no resistance, then you know that's it, not going to make you stronger. Yeah. It, 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 if I'm lifting a one tenth of a pound, you know, dumbbell. 
<laughs> and thinking that that's going to, you know, make my make make me have big, massive, you know, biceps, then we all know that that doesn't work that way. Well, there, there, that truth, that reality carries over into our spiritual lives and our and our and our and our Christian walk in the sense of if there's nothing that chat if there, if nothing's a challenge then how do we grow right that was sort of your right point too, Donna, right 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 yes. so what the other yeah. guy, and also you know it's easy to have hope when life circumstances are good and great so the world needs to see that you can have hope right when in the midst of tragedy and. Yeah. Also, you've got a situation where if you get sick and you think this is terrible, and yet you begin to realize that other people get sick too, and you have more sympathy for them. If you never got sick, you never felt pain. So why? So if you know Don gets sick, the son has pain, so what? Right. But if you if you have been down that corridor of a pain and suffering you say, oh my god this is terrible this you have more sympathy for them for one thing mm -hmm. right it's like um if if you've not ever been in someone else's shoes how can you say how they feel right which is also why it's so important um you know christ came and lived and died for our salvation and that's the right. easy part. It, not the easy part, but that you know that's the that's the high level part of the story that we normally talk about. But the reality is he came and dealt with, suffered through, encountered everything that we do and encounter. You know, in every way he was tempted like us, in every way he was put under the the suffering and the and the stresses and the struggles that we were put under. To Mickey's point, that not that God didn't know this already, but even more so. Um, his ability to relate and, you know, sympathize is not the right word. Empathize is really the more correct word. Yes. Um, yes. Not just feel sorry for what we're going through, but understand and appreciate what we're going through. I sometimes worry about people who turn around and say it's in God's hand, everything's going to be okay. I think that God is trying to tell us that we're going to suffer. And that we've got to develop, as Donna says, a better personality. We've got to develop uh, not only a persistent concept of, of uh, positive thinking, but we've also got to be able to uh, positively go through these difficult times. And, and I think if we didn't have pain and suffering, I don't think we'd be uh, as good a Christians as we should be. Uh, it made me think of um, 2 Corinthians when it says, uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all, all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God for just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance so also our comfort is abundant through Christ I think Donna's got a good point in the sense that if you have somebody that's acting let's say ugly to you or mean or mean spirited to you uh, there's a whole bunch of reasons for it you don't need to you return evil for evil all you're doing is escalating the problem but if you sit back and say I'm sorry the way you feel and you know <laughs> try to assist them if they want assistance uh, but you don't you don't go down that path of uh, hate, meanness, and you don't develop that mentality. So I guess that's what I'm about to say. Because we we won't reflect Christ if we do, which doesn't it doesn't show that we have hope, but it certainly doesn't help them see the need for Christ, if that makes sense. If everybody's screaming and shooting at each other, yeah. <laughs> it gets worse. We're just yeah. all being the same. All being There's savage. No difference. Yeah. See, that's, that's sort of a, a, an example I was wondering about, and I don't know if this should be said, but for example, the uh, school shooting a few weeks ago with the little children, um, you know, a lot of people would wonder why that would happen. Why, 
what does that have to happen? Those little children didn't do anything. And, you know, the parents have to live through that. And, and how can you um, not be frustrated or aggravated because that happened? And I know that um, I'm away from it and I've not actually seen something or know someone that has been through that, but they would have a, or I would feel like even if they're believers or non-believers would have such a question of why that would happen. Right. You know, and there's a, there was a book, this is probably now 40 years ago, you know, uh, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People or something like that. Everybody yeah. Know that, you know? And um, the very, the very problem with that is actually in the title. Yeah. Because it presumes, it presumes that we are good people. Mm-hmm. And it also presumes that there's a one-on-one -on -one correlation between being good and not having adversity and being bad and having adversity. If you're, if you're doing evil things, you are going to have adversity. That, that, that correlation is true. But because it's a fallen world, um, the opposite correlation is not true. Um, who, who is more good than Christ? No one. And no what was... One. And what was the level of suffering that he had to endure? A lot of the, uh, just about the worst suffering ever. Yeah, I mean, she, uh, to, to, to the point of, you know, a painful execution death. So again, you know, that this, this concept of that we're going, that our Christianity is sometime, somehow a magic, you know, protector amulet, you know, thing that keeps us from enduring suffering is a, um, those of us who have read God's word and have lived and are believers, we know that, but I guess my question would be this, I'd love to hear thoughts on this, do you think the world thinks the same way about that, that we do, they, do they think that we think that being that prevents us from having suffering? Over things in your life. I love that. That's a good point. That's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> Sorry, we lost we you. Lost for a minute. You. Okay. Um, we just figured out the first four verses of Genesis six while you were gone, so don't worry about it. <laughs> um, the thing that's really struck me because we, you know, we in the situation we are now with Kathy's mom, and we're going through the what we're going through in terms of being remote more on Sunday mornings. I mean, Kathy is taking her mom to to the church her church this morning like she's been in the habit of doing which i don't know what that means for us long term whether we need to adjust because of that but we've been here on sunday mornings in the period of time before i go downstairs to put on sterlingwood service uh guess who's on the tv talking to me if it's left on where, where the news was right before almost invariably when i go downstairs because Ch uh, channel 13's news was on on the TV before I came up, when I come downstairs, it's Joel Osteen. Oh. <laughs> and so, you know, so, so I ended up picking up, you know, I obviously don't seek him out and, and watch him, you know, intentionally, but I, I get little snippets because of that, right? We can't help but see the advertisements that we see, you know, all the time on TV. Mm -hmm. And to get, if you listen to him and the flavor of Christianity that's portrayed there, mm -hmm. everything's going to be fine and dandy. Oh, yes. Everything's so positive. And he's such a, a loving God and he's going to, you know, protect you. And it, it's like um, there's no negatives, I guess. And, you know, that just looking here at what is literally being said here in uh, in, in first Peter, in this case, it's chapter three directly opposes that concept right here it says there's going to be suffering and, and that might be a good um thought of what i was thinking um like his followers church joel Osteen, would be the ones that would 
not be able to understand why people have to suffer if he's such a good positive God all the time and doesn't put you through situations that are difficult. I think the Old Testament helps us out in the sense that Moses was confronted by the people in the wilderness and they told him that they had problems with the snakes. They were afraid of the snakes. And, and they said, you, you talk to God. Why don't you talk to him and tell him we won't relieve from this. Moses came back and, and God told him to have a staff, his staff, and have an image of a snake on it. In other words, you'll confront your problems. You won't run from your problems. Oh. There, mm -hmm. you have problems. You've got to be able to confront your problems. That's the way I interpret it. Yes, I see what you're saying. Well, then I, I'm also, uh, certainly I agree with that, Nikki. The other thing that I'm struck by is just thinking about the author of this book, thinking of Peter. And um, if you think of Peter from scripture, you know, a lot of images come to mind. We've talked about it before. You know, his, his answer to the question of you know, who, who do you say I am? But, you know, the most, probably the, the three or the two or three most relevant things that I think of about Peter are during the time of, of the Passion, what do we know about Peter? What did he do while Christ is under trial? He denied him. Uh, went so far, you know, to curse and went out of his way to make, I, I'm not with him. Okay. Uh, which, of course, which, of course, had been there. So. But then when, when we see Peter after the resurrection, it's one of my favorite passages of scripture, which is the restoration of Peter there on the beach of the Sea of Galilee, you know, where Christ asks him three times, do you love me? The parallel back to the three denials. But then the next big event we see with Peter is what? There's, a, there's multiple ones, but what's the next big one that we see? We just lost them again. Um we see Pentecost, we see him preaching at Pentecost. And the result of him going out on the limb to doing that, to do that, was that he endured suffering in response to that. Oh, okay, right. So, you know, that becomes, that becomes a big thing. Well, able to figure out where I can, I can think of the script. Sure, but I can't remember where it's at. Right. But ones that I use frequently, I know where they are. That's good. That's good. But I do sometimes have to, even in a counseling session, I'm like, oh, where's that, where's that verse? I know it's in this side of the page. Yeah. It's in <laughs> yeah, I was just telling, to, well, we're back. So we, we, we lost you guys for a second there. So yeah, um, Kevin Power searches or something. Hmm. AC cuts on and off. All right. So the, the, I think the example I was talking about right before you guys got cut out and we were gone is that I was particularly thinking about the example of Peter as the author of this book. We have the denial during the Passion, right? We have that wonderful scene on the beach in Galilee, which is one of my favorite pieces of scripture, where he's restored by Christ being asked three times, do you love me to parallel the denial? But what is the next big event that we see in scripture with Peter? And that's him preaching at Pentecost. Mm -hmm. and you know to me you know and all the apologetic stuff which i love and i can get wrapped down into you know case for christ kind of stuff and evidence that demands a verdict stuff i, I just eat that mm -hmm. stuff up but to me the absolute biggest proof of the fact that christ was resurrected is look at peter and the other disciples before and look mm -hmm. at peter and the other disciples after and Whatever it was, tell me something didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Dramatic. Yeah, because they're not the same people. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what they endure throughout most, most of the book of Acts is about uh, the, the early parts there about Peter and, the, and, and James and John and the other disciples there in Jerusalem. That's the first, you know, what, quarter to a third of the book of Acts. The last of the book of Acts is about Paul. And if you just were to go through and just put a put a hash mark by every time there was persecution, suffering, pain, versus, you know, th there were positive things in there, not to overlook the positive things, but you would get this big, long ledger of what? You get this big, long ledger of suffering and persecution. 
And yet, what did they keep doing? You know, to the point that when Pete, when Paul's in prison, what are they doing? They're singing in jail. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the original jailhouse rock, not not Elvis Presley, but it's you know, <laughs> but but it, but it's Paul. You know, it's Paul in, in in Philippi. You know, singing in the jail again. That's what they're doing in the midst of what in the midst of suffering. And as a result of that, it's this last point that was on the outline there, which is that God will use us when we suffer. Right. And again, I would much prefer, can I have the version of use without the suffering, God? Can we, I get it. You know, I don't need to learn the lesson. Got it. You know, move on. Well, you mm -hmm. only learn the lesson. I think this was Donna's point earlier. You only learn the lesson by going through it. Right. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you have an intellectual knowledge of the lesson, but no experiential knowledge of the lesson. And they're not the same thing. And to Mickey's point, um, our ability to emphasize emphasize empathize with um, <laughs> with those that are suffering is enhanced when we've gone through the same things the same trials and tribulations right any other thoughts or comments was well, it uh one of the great russian writers who was in the gulag uh, he pointed out that the guards were vicious and mean and cruel, unbelievable. So, but he said the people they feared were the people who were very uh, devout Christians because they couldn't do it. They could, you know, work them over physically and, and try to do it mentally. But it really didn't have that much effect. I mean, they were suffering, obviously, but they, you know, they would turn around, forgive their guard, and et cetera, et cetera. So it, they really began to fear those people because they felt like there's something going on that they're not aware of. You know, that was some, something that something they couldn't even control. Exactly. There is the yeah. point. There's the point. And it would be, you know, normally the purpose of mo most, you know, torture or persecution is to either obtain something, you know, right? The person gets tortured to get information, but most often it's about exerting that you have control over them. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, you know, the was it was it is it Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Am I thinking of the right person here? Who was? Um, yeah, Bonhoeffer. Yeah, that's another. Then, you know, and, yeah. and talked about you know the, just the small mental things. You know that were, it may seem small, but they were so huge because of the context. Mm -hmm. Right. Another great question. All right. So, what's the application of this? I think we've hit most of it. There is good in suffering. Also, there's another twist on this that uh, there have been many times I would get angry and want to be physically violent. And I realized that's not the thing to do because if you're inflicting pain and suffering on somebody else, and you know just back off calm down um, so i think there's several different ways to look at this concept of, of uh, pain and if we don't have pain we don't have to stick our hand in the in the, in the fire so to speak right now i was also just struck there by again by thinking about paul paul experienced some type we don't know what it was but some type of pain right the, the, yes. the born in the flesh right well you know i have my my theory but whatever it was it was real to him yes and you know what what was god's response to his request for that to be removed no my grace is sufficient my grace is sufficient and you know, i've heard this preached so many times and i believe it's true i think that's part of the lesson and application for us out of that was um you know, my take on Paul for the reasons that we've talked about him before we did our act study is Paul was a really smart guy. You know, when Paul gives his biography, I was a Jew among Jews, you know, a Pharisee among Pharisees, blah, blah, blah. You, you know what that thorn in the flesh did for Paul? It sort of cut him down a notch. It made him more humble. 
<laughs> because with that, he had to have that grace. He had to have that to endure it. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, Paul's like, hey, look at me. Uh, well, we got to we gotta have things that keep us dependent on God. Right. And trials and tribulations, hopefully, if we think of it properly, cause us to be dependent on him. Right. Right. And so that, you know, that's part of the reason for the suffering. And then I was thinking of the word perseverance and endurance. And how James says to count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, because it produces something. It, it's testing our faith to produce endurance so that we can be perfect and complete. Yeah. And I'll just share this because I was actually listening this morning to an audio book, a work related audio book. Does anybody ever, does anybody, is everybody here familiar with the program called Outward Bound? Um, no. it's, um, the, the way that it normally is done, it, it, it's normally people that uh, voluntarily participate in like these, you know, wilderness experience things where, you know, they go with very little rations or something for a week, live mm -hmm. off the land, but basically they, they expose themselves to hardship by, you know, going through something here that's, it's artificial in the sense of you're choosing to do it, but it's real in the sense of it's real. And so if you've ever seen like some of the Spartan races or some of the other things, you know, where these, you know, teams are overcoming obstacles and things like that, is uh, that sort of inspired by this, um, by this outward bound movement. But I didn't know the backstory of the, I knew what outward bound was. And, and by the way, this is often used in, with people that are overcoming um, um, addictions and things like that, you know, to, to persevere through those things. But the origin of Outward Bound was a guy, a British shipping owner during World War II, who was having a pretty, or in the early parts of World War II, when um, the Battle of the Atlantic was still tipped in favor of the Germans, and a number of his ships were sunk by German U-boats. And what he noticed was that the survivors, his crew that survived, was abnormally um um what's the word i'm looking for weighted towards being the older less physically fit members of his crew versus the young um physically fit members of the crew you would think that you know getting dumped in the cold waters of the north atlantic during a ship during a sinking that if you're younger and more physically fit you would have a more likely chance of surviving than if you were older and less physically fit. He just you know, thought it through logically. And so he actually looked into it, you know, trying to understand what that was about. And what they discovered was it had to do with the ability of the older members of the crew to deal with the emotional and psychological adversity of being put in that situation. That it, that it wasn't so much about your physical makeup as it was about your mental and emotional makeup and the realization was there that if you were older and more experienced, you were probably better to better capable of dealing with this sudden adversity mentally and emotionally. Um, and that was more important, actually, than what you were able to do physically. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. There's also another story of the English uh, who were captured by the Germans and put in a concentration camp. And they, they also, of course, told them, we're just going to have a good time. All everybody's going to sing, carry on, one hand, rations were cut, et cetera, et cetera. But their attitude was no matter what, we're going to have a good time. And that's what happened. And they all came out. So right. this, this positive attitude towards even the roughest situation mm -hmm. is good. Agreed. And, and this guy found it outward bound to sort of create situations that would build that mental, emotional toughness. And his comment was he would much rather have the lifeboat being uh, um, winched down by an 80-year-old self-taught sailor than a 20-year-old fresh out of the academy member of the crew because of, of the experience that was there. And it really struck me as we were going through this. Why, why did that happen in the world? Because they, those folks who were able to survive had been through suffering before and they were ready to endure it again. 
Right. And I think that, you know, part of the lesson, um, you know, part of the lesson, we that's a real world example, it has nothing to do with scripture, but it has everything to do with scripture. Awesome. All right, we've lost them again. They must be having some real issues there. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording, Diana. Okay.